Hello, everyone. Great to have you all tuning in to our recorded session here of our Artist Circle Tech Talk. Um, we are really excited to have you all tuning in. Uh, my name is Maggie Walsh. I'm the Operations and Partnerships Coordinator at The Fearless Artists, and I'm very, very excited to welcome uh, Charmaine Hussein, who is here uh, to talk to us about her experience in the NFT space and some exciting projects she's working on as well. Uh, just to give a really brief introduction, uh, Charmaine is a world builder and lore lover using stories to create an empathetic, inclusive metaverse. She brings 25 years of experience creating movements that matter for Fortune 500 brands, top five retailers, and global nonprofits. She's worked with celebrities and been to the White House, but feels most at home in her magical world called the Enchanted Valley, which we will be hearing about uh, later on. So thank you so much for joining us, Charmaine. Um, I'd love to just get things started. If you can just tell us a little bit about your story. Um, what was it like for you coming to the, the United States from Pakistan? And um, just a little bit about yourself, if you wanna give more of an introduction. For sure, for sure. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I uh, am uh, originally uh, from Pakistan, a really small town there. I was born in Canada. My dad was disabled. He come for some, uh, you know, treatment. And then we uh, immediately, maybe by the time I was like five years old, went back to Pakistan, moved in with my mother's family. And things financially were really hard for my parents. So they, um, you know, when I was five, put me into like a little orphanage, boarding school kind of thing. And so my early start in life was kind of like this combination of memories from Canada, English probably was my first language. And then I'm in this place which was run by Christian missionaries and nuns with a, a lot of different kids from different, uh, you know, backgrounds. Uh, growing up, very early exposed to that kind of diversity uh, and, and trying to like just find my way and feeling very unsettled and feeling like I didn't belong anywhere. Uh, when I would speak, people would start giggling because of my accent, nobody understood me. There were so many different language speakers, I couldn't understand them. By the time I was six, seven, eight, nine, things started stabilizing for my parents who were really still like financially, you know, like on, our families were doing better than us, let's say. We were like the poor re relatives for everyone, you know, but we had that safety net. And so I started growing up and moved back into our home. Uh, you know, I had siblings. Um, our our uh, family life was very insular. We belong to this like a religious order that tends to marry within itself. For 600 years, these one million, one and a half million people all really are convinced that this is the right way. And it's a beautiful community. And for people who like it, it's wonderful. But because of my background, even my name Charmaine is a French Canadian name. Uh, I just never felt like I fit in. At 16, I was engaged to be married. Uh, I broke that engagement off, applied to, you know, uh, for my old library book, like the top 10 schools in the world that give the most scholarships. Most of them tended to be US private universities, wrote something, I don't know what I did. I wasn't in my school, the person who had the highest SAT scores. I wasn't the person with like the best grades. I got in, I got into eight out of the 10 schools. I came to Stanford because they were the only ones willing to even give a ticket to me. And so I end up at Stanford. I don't even know what kind of a school it is. Like my background was just not the kind where, you know, we had family members who were going to like these great universities or whatnot. But I got a second start in life. I really feel like Stanford was a rebirth for me because all this information that never felt right, I was never religious. And I always felt like everyone belongs and this idea that like only we are going to heaven or all of that kind of stuff was not vibing with who I am as a human being. But I come to Stanford and I get exposed to all these different people. And they had put me in a core curriculum called The Great Works, which was about reading the, the you know, Western perspective, colonial perspective on what are the great great works in the world. And I got a chance to like get exposed to history, philosophy, other religions, other ways of thinking, I was hooked. And uh, I met my husband there, he's from India, he's a Hindu, uh, Pakistani Muslim, Indian Hindu, both small town people, our families like, you know, were, <laughs> no, this is not, we do arrange marriages in our culture, but we got married. 
And we, by this time, I thought India Pakistan would be at peace, you know, uh, with each other. We've been trying to like hope that like marriages like ours and people like us will bring that unity. That's not happened, but we did manage to craft for ourselves a beautiful life in the Bay Area with friends that are, you know, relatively accepting, wonderful. And uh, that was the beginning of sort of my first part of my journey. Then we have a child and then my child came out and that completely put everything, uh, you know, full stop for us again. We had to like restart. And that I would say is like my, my third, you know, awakening, if you will, or my third sort of like, you know, phase of my life that we can talk about. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's always wonderful to hear your story and just how there's so much, um, like you were saying, just bringing in diversity and I think really highlighting so much intersectionality and all of these different issues right from the beginning. Um, so like you were saying uh, with your child, um, I know you spent uh, several years um, uh, as an activist after your, your child came out um, and uh, working to advocate for LGBTQ plus rights specifically. So I'd love for you to tell us a bit more about your journey in the activism space and kind of what you learned in the process. For sure. So we only have one child. He was about 14 when he came out, you know, and I would say I thought we were very progressive. We're living in a small suburb in the Bay Area. Um, our wedding itself, my husband and I, like, you know, we had a Jewish uh, best friend who gave me away. On his side, there was a Sikh family, a Christian family, and a Jan family. And this was, you know, the marriage was done in a very Muslim style in my small community. And it, it felt like as multicultural as I could think one of our weddings could ever get. Our friends were exactly like that. We were living in the San Francisco Bay Area. You would think that, you know, my child's coming out would not be a big deal. It was a big deal. We were not prepared. We were not educated. I actually thought it was bad parenting on my part. Uh, you know, until then, I'd been living that immigrant life. Uh, I'd gone to Bain and Company. I'd gone to Kellogg Business School. I was working in, uh, you know, uh, CPG firms after falling in love uh, during an internship at Coca-Cola with the whole idea of brand management and working on big brands. You know, I just gotten off like this amazing campaign with Keith Urban. I did another one with Tim McGraw. I'd written an episode for Top Chef. I was like, you know, on a high, like, packaging and advertising that I'd done was like in every major retailer in the US. I helped get Clorox into like, you know, 90% of hospitals uh, in the country from like 10 to 20%. Like I was doing well on a career, uh, you know, from a career trajectory standpoint. Then my child came out and I quit work. And uh, I was going to be trying to fix my child basically and figure out where I went wrong. Fix parenting, fix myself, fix my child was really my mindset until I started learning and diving deeper. My child is an amazing person. Samir Jha, people can like, you know, check him or Google him. Just a wonderful teacher. He wants to be a high school teacher. And his first sort of practice was on parents. Very patiently, he would sort of explain things to us slowly. I started reading up, learning. And my child wanted to be the activist. And initially I was just a parent keeping him safe going places with him because I was uh, scared about his mental health. He had been bullied severely and had hidden uh, his experiences from us. Uh, and now he wanted to make sure no other child was bullied. And so I thought that was like not a bad idea, not a bad thing. And I started accompanying him to like all these LGBTQIA conferences and slowly started getting the ammunition and the learning to come back to our school districts. We changed policies in first our city, then like our state, then started working with international, national and international like organizations. My child was on the board for HRC, Glisten. He's done work with GLAD, Tyler Clementi Foundation. Like you name it, there has been some sort of interaction. And uh, all the time I was just trying to do the same uh, with immigrant communities, religious communities, trying to create acceptance, family acceptance for LGBTQIA children. Uh, and my child then went to uh, college. I found myself with some time and then COVID happened. I uh, used art as sort of a way to channel everything that I had learned and done. You know, uh, it was great. Like we, you know, even um, last year, this uh, summer, we were invited to the White House uh, to bring pride back. So we were always making progress and that felt good. And then, then it also felt like there was always so much more 
progress to be made. And that was what my art was about. And during this time, I discovered the NFT space. In fact, it was exactly a year ago. And I started realizing all these different elements of my life, my business, my sort of like folksy background and my small town upbringing and learning the power of storytelling there that got me to Stanford, that then allowed me to like go to business school and, and then learn how to tell the stories of brands and then help my child learn how to tell his story to like move hearts and minds. And all of that, and then like my learnings in visual art during my whole like COVID era, I felt was coming together in this NFT space where I felt like, wow, first global marketplace ever, first global marketplace in the history of humanity for artists and creatives. You know, this is not a few people sitting in a cafe in Paris or like some people in Florence getting together we are taking all of the world's creatives and they're like starting to come in, in, in thousands, you know, hearing stories and coming and coming. And we're all able to talk and, and look at each other and share knowledge. And we have this ability now to move into this metaverse and create a metaverse, which can be better than the world we're in and tell these stories and make sure it's diverse. Tell these stories that are not told, showcase and represent people that are hidden how do we remove those sort of like, you know, barriers that marginalize people? How do we break down those systems that exist in the real world uh, that keep people sort of like underrepresented and get, keep people, you know, oppressed uh, and in the metaverse create something that can be better, can be a beacon of hope, even maybe translate things back in the real world. And that's kind of like the journey I've been on for the last one year. That's great. Thank you so much. I love um, how you talk about education as like so essential to the activism and, and just opening people's eyes and making them more okay and accepting of all of these things and how um, then that, like you were saying, it brings into this idea of storytelling as like the best way to educate people and really bring them in and create empathy and things like that. Um, and so like what you were talking about with NFTs, you know, when we spoke last week, um, one thing that really, really stood out to me is when you said that we have to make sure that the digital world does not replicate real world injustices. I wrote that down. I've been thinking about it a lot since you said that. And so um, uh, my next question here is, uh, how do you make it so that storytelling in the NFT space can serve as an agent of change um, and just creating a space where uh, these injustices uh, can't and don't e exist? Um, so it's always going to be a journey, right? There's always going to be, you know, uh, some injustice, but fantasy worlds like Enchanted Valley, which is my platform, I can give specific examples. You know, we have this beautiful fantasy world we're trying to create. I always say, you know, what if like, uh, I, you know, if I dream big dreams, then, you know, the Marvel universe started with comics, maybe, you know, Star Wars started with a movie, Harry Potter started with a book, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings started with a book, and then eventually you can have these sort of like, you know, all of these universes end up with like comics, and books, and movies, and maybe even a musical or a play, and eventually a theme park, and so I'm like, okay, we're on a mission to start with NFTs, but create a world step-by-step step, starting with NFTs, but going down the exact same you know, path. We're starting at a different point, but we wanna end up with a theme park. So think about 10 to 15 years from now, if you want to create something that like has a theme park associated with it, where people would wanna come in, step in and feel like, wow, this is all like, you know, so real and they're loving it so much, what would you do? And the difference is that this theme park, this world, this universe, this, the movies, the plays, every single thing we're gonna do is going to be inclusive. It's going to be, the fantasy is going to be that every single person can feel at home there. Every person sees themselves represented. They feel safe, they feel, I don't even love the words acceptance or include, inclusion I, or diversity even. I want people to be celebrated for their uniqueness. I want us to be in a place where people know and recognize that even if folks think that they're parts of these different tribes, there are no two people in the world who are alike. Every single person is unique. And we're a world where uniqueness is celebrated. It's an enchanted valley. Valleys are where people sort of like trickle in and they're beautiful, they're abundant, they're lush. 
all great civilizations started by, you know, started like near valleys. Ours is going to be a valley where we're going to start a new meta metaverse, new digital civilization that's going to invite everyone to come uh, and participate. And so that is the sort of larger vision. And then the way we do it right and the way we sort of like make sure that the stories we're telling are making a difference is the web three versus the web two model. Right. So like your web one is, you know, for, you know, I'm sure like uh, at this point, like, you know, most of the people who are listening uh, kind of are aware, but like for me, it's always a reminder because everyone thinks about it differently. And the way I think about it is like web one was static information being fed to you, you know, like big brother esque. <laughs> web two became all about networking. You know, people are having conversations and they're sharing information, but they're like in these small little networks. Web3 is completely decentralized, right? And that's the vision. It, has it been completely decentralized? No, right? But, but the vision is it's about bringing in like the payment structures, you know, to those social networks. And it's about decentralizing things using the blockchain. You know, how can we use these new technologies now to like invite everyone uh, to participate? And um, the fact that you can have asset ownership creates wealth. So you can invite everyone and it's not a token invitation. It's not a performative thing. You can actually bring people the way you create a diverse metaverse, the way you create a diverse fantasy world is by including the people who need to be there from the very beginning and having them build with you. And you make sure that their stories lead to wealth generation, that their reality allows them to change their family life and then you know support other people like them, then they bring other people. And so we are starting and building from ground up that way. So my first six months in the space was all just onboarding. I probably spent 750 hours onboarding uh, on Clubhouse. I would do these daily rooms. You know, I had a lot of wonderful uh, other community leaders doing the same. And we were like bringing in people who had like, you know, language barriers, who were like coming from international communities, people who couldn't talk about their identity in their own communities. And now many of those people are either like, you know, holders of the tokens to our world. They are like basically, each token represents a resident of Enchanted Valley. So either they're, you know, token holders or they're actually part of our creative team. It's a global team of 20. They're collectors, or we also have like a Muses Chosen program uh, where we're like just starting to take in all these applications. And those are gonna be the artists and the creators. They don't have to buy, collect. They don't even have to know us. If they're interested and want to participate, well, we have a mechanism for having them come, tell their stories, be part of our universe, our, our sort of fairy tale world, and we reward them for it. Wonderful. Thank you. I really love what you said about, you know, it's not inclusion, it's celebrating people. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, and I'm so, so excited about the Enchanted Valley project. Um, I would love to know, even just from uh, more of like a practical standpoint, what was it like to kind of bring your vision about the Enchanted Valley project to life, like with building your team and, and onboarding people and just uh, getting everyone uh, to execute on this project and this idea? Yeah. So, you know, we um, are in a marketplace, the NFT marketplace sometimes can attract a lot of like get rich quick, you know, uh, people or young people even who are there because of the excitement everything feels very shiny and you know they're doing things but they don't have the experience sometimes to like you know stay in it for the long run I was really worried uh and wasn't I love uh you know collectible projects right these are NFT collectibles that attract these large communities you have you know the ability to communicate and do great works together I was lucky enough to have a board ape you know, if uh, people are familiar with it, I got like mine on the, the next morning, the secondary market, and I kept it for a long time, sold it, and that uh, is funding my part of Enchanted Valley. When I started Enchanted Valley, it was just my collection. It was like an NFT collection made by me. Uh, I was very quickly, within weeks, joined by this amazing fintech expert. He works at MasterCard. He was one of my collectors and we started talking about using technology and marrying technology to this vision to make it bigger. 
And then we were joined by the symbologist. He's an architect based out of India, very young. And he sort of came in and started doing all the brand design. And then I reached out to this person who does fantasy art like you wouldn't believe. Violetta is her name and she's out of Italy. She's been like, you know, a global traveler. I didn't know anything about her background. I just knew that she was making the types of characters I wish I could draw. And I was like, hey, if we do a bigger project, would you be interested? And now it's been seven months. She was in some of the, you know, she, she was on a trajectory with like all of this momentum. She put everything on hold and completely became part of Enchanted Valley and is our lead artist. You know, her, if, if I dream, she is the one who creates everything uh, and just is like phenomenal. Uh, and then we then, you know, met uh, a writer who has 20 projects to his credit, Emmy nominated writer, you know, worked with Disney, worked with all these big studios. He joined us. Then we have a musician now who's designing the so soundscape for Enchanted Valley, who's, you know, worked with big celebrities, has been doing sound design since he was 11. Uh, and he joined us. We have a team of 20 people now. And the common theme and the reason why these people joined is not money. Most of them have not received any payments yet. Like, right, we're still building. We're in a startup mode. Uh, Violetta for seven months has just been doing artwork, you know, because she buys into this vision of what we're doing, as do I, as does everyone else. So everyone is attracted and the way the team has happened is organically and mission driven. This idea of creating a metaverse that's diverse and inclusive is what's bringing them in. And then the work is so brilliant, it brings in other people as well. Um, it's hard and challenging to have a team distributed across seven time zones uh, and they're perfectionists. So the other hard part is like Violetta is a great example. We you know, could have launched maybe like three months before we just launched our project with a really small collection that's sort of a little bit of a, uh, sort of a, like a invitation, if you will. It's not the full thing, but it's a little small little, you know, glimpse into our world. We like uh, rewarding early collectors. And so this is like our next, you know, small little collection inviting people in. We like to like learn and grow slowly. Violetta has like a record breaking collection. There has been no collection yet in the NFT space with the number of traits, which are all hand-drawn little details that need to go together in a generator. Like the Board Apes had maybe 200, 300 in that range. Most collections that have 10,000 pieces would roughly have that many. Uh, I recently heard of like one collection that was talking about being a record breaker. They had 800. We, for our like 10K project, have 1,500 unique traits because our gins do not look like our fey, our fey do not look like our water nymphs. We have all five different unique orders and within each order, which you know um, is like one fifth of the collection, she has as many traits as an entire large collection would. Because, and this is where like people like Violetta and being mission driven to attract the right team is important she was like, if we're celebrating uniqueness and if we're about making everyone feel welcome, then we have to represent all kinds of diversity, which means we need vitiligo skin. We need people with eye patches. We need people with scarring. We need to have all different shades of like color. And then also like different types of things that people might not even imagine if they want to and escape that way. We need to have like leaf that like look like turbans. We need to have like, you know, uh, tattooed, uh, you know, people or people who love like pipes represented. What about this? What about that? She has tried to represent like, you know, ancient like hairstyles from like, I would say like some sort of like, it almost makes me feel like, you know, it's like a, a creature that has just stepped out of like, you know, a palace in ancient China, as well as like, you know, something that you could find in a rural, you know, mountain area of like Pakistan. She has taken all of this diversity and sort of started incorporating it in our first collection, which is why it's taken her seven months, but it's something magnificent to behold.
Wow, that's just so exciting and so incredible to have so much uh, diversity and just uniqueness with and with- gender diversity. I forgot to talk about that even like all different kinds of genders represented. We don't mention what gender it is. People can just pick their character and assume the gender, but we have a lot of diversity there too. That's awesome. I love to hear that. Um, clearly, you know, Enchanted Valley makes like a very conscious effort to incorporate all different types of diversity, like you were just saying, in the art and in the storytelling. Um, and so one thing that I think is like a, a conversation that I'm hearing a lot um, is with like performative re- representation. And I know Enchanted Valley very consciously incorporates diversity at all levels, uh, going deeper than this kind of performative representation so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that yeah it helps like that we are trying to like be inclusive of women BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus people by having a team that has those identities right so I always say you know what like it's very hard to be performative when we feel like our very existence and the existence of our future generations are at stake with what we're doing. That's how urgently we feel about this because this is us. We're not doing something. We're not like, you know, people who are like bringing in a token few folks for diversity purposes and trying to imagine what that looks like. When we're building our world, we're trying to put ourselves and our family members in there. Uh, I myself, right, I'm the mom of a queer and gender, uh, you know, non-binary child. And so for me, Enchanted Valley is a very selfish motive. I want to leave the world a little bit better for him, you know, than the one he inherited. I don't want him, his friends and children like him to get bullied ever again. And so I'm trying to create a better version of a Harry Potter, you know. I want to, um, we won't even go into like all the transphobia (laughs) that's in there and there, but, you know, I think that was one of the big things that I remember happening was, my child just turned 20. His entire childhood was, a, he's half Muslim. And so there was like 9-11 happened a month after he was born. And then at the same time, the first Harry Potter book came out. And there were like two different sort of things that were all about the like good versus evil happening in the world. And in this, this sort of like life he grew up with every birthday being a Harry Potter movie or a book release or whatnot. And then all of that gets shattered. You grow up as as my child did and realize, you know, he can't even enjoy the thing that like uh, was his escape because, you know, he's transgender and uh, under attack by the very author he like loved for so long. So I don't know if people know all this background, you can go Google uh, and research, uh, you know, what I'm talking about. But that is why for me, for people on our team, we all have our stories. This world we're building is sort of like a very selfish uh, attempt, you know? And so everyone can like know that what we are doing, we really mean it. And I think that's the right way to do it. I think people should be telling their own lived experiences and stories about themselves. And if you can have a world where that can happen, uh, you know, then it will be richer and it'll be more beautiful. Or like our our, uh, main author, right? He uh, is Jewish, comes from the Kabbalah tradition, is married to this beautiful person, you know, who's mixed race. They just had a baby. And why he's writing these beautiful fluid characters, you know, adding a pansexual main character, you know, people who have all these different languages and cultural influences is because he wants his one month old baby to, uh, you know, be accepted in the world. So that's how we get away from like uh, the whole performative side is like just having the right team. I love that. Yeah, I think that's so valuable. I had a, a similar experience here, a child where very much like growing up on Harry Potter and all of these different worlds that I was so, so invested in. And then learning that creators of those worlds weren't in fact as accepting of me as I felt in those worlds that they had created. And that was just such a, a big turning point in my life. And so I think it's so, so important um, with projects like Enchanted Valley to just be constantly growing and including more and just bringing people in and creating those spaces. So really, really admire what you're doing. Thank you. And the the good part about Web3 that I was mentioning is, you know, if you're a token holder, you get to write your characters in, you get to contribute to lore, right? That's how these NFT collections are. They're like invitations to become part of the community. And so that's where we like are like, we don't have to get everything right. 
we just need to have that door open. We create like sort of like the guardrails, we create like the, the world enough and then invite people to come and create in it. And then that way we make sure it is truly inclusive because there's no way even a team of 20 or 200, you know, or even 2000 will get everything right. But as long as it's open uh, and can, and has that ability to grow, you know, uh, and, and be inclusive, then I think, you know, folks can come in and just like, yeah, come in and be part of Enchanted Valley, make it better. I love that. Absolutely love that. Um, I have one more question for yeah. you. Um, kind of looking into the future. Um, last week when we spoke, uh, you had told me uh, creativity is currency. Um, so kind of with that in mind, you know, how do you see uh, creatives uh, contributing to the world in the future and and where do we go from here? Yeah, I definitely think that one of the mantras in Enchanted Valley is that creativity is currency. I think that's true for the entire NFT space. I feel like NFTs right now are much more just about art that's going to evolve, right? People talk about a lot of different, uh, you know, digital assets that need to have some sort of provenance attached to it which could be even your vaccination card. There might be privacy issues with medical records and all of that having, you know, uh, sort of being on the blockchain, but there's potential for NFTs to grow way beyond um, just the art. But the metaverse itself cannot, right? It is a world that is digitally created. And so everyone involved in making it come to life, you know, um, is going to be, um, and NFTs are enabler, right, of the metaverse. So anyone who's involved has to be creative. Like we talk about even in Enchanted Valley that our technologists are creatives because they're creatively problem solving, trying to like understand our lore and figure out where we need to go and then making the technology support that. So in a digital world, like the art and the story and the music and your imagination, you know, I would rather even flip it and say anyone with imagination needs to be sort of tapping into their imagination and then using whatever skill sets that they know to bring that to life. So therefore we're moving from these siloed worlds where you have like, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a technologist, I'm a this, I'm a that, to we're all creatives together. We're creatives creating and that creativity is currency. Now the way ho the whole creativity is currency came to be though, that, that phrase, was a, a reminder that a socioeconomic income is also important, you know, an, a socioeconomic sort of diversity is also important and not everyone has the income levels to participate. Even sometimes minting an NFT can be cost prohibitive. And so the way we are building our Enchanted Valley is like trying to make sure we take that into account always. We deliberately started our first month and a half. We have not done a single paid advertisement yet. Like all of our, our influencer marketing or any of those kinds of things, we have just done the, the all organic word of mouth, trying to tap into our own micro communities and our very first exclusive like collector's pass, which other collections do it, it's priced much higher, you know, and it's a way to get the whales in. We priced it way lower. It was at a 30% discount. And it was a way to get a lot of people for whom NFTs, like this NFT was their first one. And we use this collector's base of ours. We treat them like our most important constituents, but they are in our minds, people who are also going to need the education, the resources, the help to grow into the NFT community. So the other thing that we did is a der derivative contest. A lot of people can't buy NFTs from us. Well, we're like, okay, come and create take our images and do your version of a fae in our land, do your version of a gin in our land. What are you gonna make? And people made music, somebody did cosplay. We had so many entries and then the winners got like, you know, a free NFT. So you have ways to use your creativity to contribute. And if you do that, then you can get, you know, what somebody else buys with ETH, you know, because they have just the money you have your creativity, that's important. So that's how that whole idea came. But I do believe we're moving to a creator's uh, you know, economy, a creative economy. And the way we start thinking about creativity has to be interdisciplinary, inclusive of everyone, 
uh, and uh, it's the way I think we're, yeah, I think the future is all creative. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I'm very excited, like hearing this whole vision for the future and um, just makes me so, so happy. Um, I wanna thank you so much again for joining us today, uh, for chatting with me all about uh, Enchanted Valley and your story as well. Um, we really, really appreciate it. I will encourage everyone listening, definitely check out Enchanted Valley um, and uh, see all of the amazingness that lies within it. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you have a chance, maybe you can share links to our website or our socials. And we'd love to get to know some of the people who are here. And if you, uh, you know, uh, watch this and uh, drop by our Discord, let us know. And we'll have a special giveaway for people who uh, watched and uh, joined our world. Uh, and thank you again.